Committee, and we've traveled together all over the state of Michigan doing uh, this presentation and a number of other things that we do for the Gilmore educational uh, PowerPoints and stuff. So we've had a lot of fun over the years doing these together. Um, and I'm really grateful for these two guys, their talent, their time, and for them being here today. Rob and Nat, of course, you may be know Robin and John Burke. Both gentlemen have spent their lives. Both gentlemen have spent their lives as educators for 37 years and probably close to 40 years of doing uh, youth. Um, Robin was in fine arts and he developed this fantastic storytelling program and theater program at Gall Lake. Many of you from Gall Lake know Robin, I'm sure. And um, John taught in Olivet for 37 years in the history department. So both are, are wonderful to have with us and do these presentations. So uh, we're grateful for that being here today. Please help me welcome Robin and John. I did not experience 
the life that uh, he was a black man. He, he uh, uh, Huey Ledbetter was a black man. I did not experience what he experienced. And so I'm not trying to appropriate these songs. I just want to try and present them to you so you can get the feeling of them. So here's Jim Crow Blue. <laughs>
to put down an entire race of people. You can understand maybe why people are a little bit concerned when they take through their old photos from college when they're young and dumb. And they come up with pictures of themselves in blackface or some press guy does. It's, it's a person. But anyway, that's where the, the name comes from for this period. And Jim Crow is, uh, it, it applies to the laws uh, segregating blacks and whites. Homer Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson. Homer Plessy decided he wanted to test the, uh, the law in Louisiana that separated blacks and whites on, on uh, trains. So he bought a ticket. First of all, how is this guy going to test anything about the law? What race would you consider him? You consider him white. But in Louisiana, he's considered black. He's an octoroon. And an octoroon is a person who has one eight black blood in it. No matter how much you have in you. You're considered black. So he buys his ticket, no problem. Gets on the train, no problem. Uh, train conductor comes by, asks for his ticket. He gives him his ticket. He says, Oh, by the way, I'm a black man. By the way, I'm African American, black American, whatever name they wanted to use at the time. Probably the color. And he got thrown off the train at the next stop and got uh, jailed and fined. Now, he's going to test this case. It goes to the courts, and the judge, whose name is Ferguson, ruled against him. Uh, he wanted to strike down the, the law of separate um, train facilities. And uh, he ruled in favor of the state. So the case is going to go all the way to the Supreme Court. So the Plessy versus Ferguson. Ferguson is the initial judge who ruled uh, in favor of the state of Louisiana. Now the reason why he was suing is because after the Civil War, there were three amendments passed in the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. They're called the Freedmen's Amendments. The 13th Amendment freed the slaves. Uh, there shall be no slavery anywhere in the country based on race, color, the previous condition of slavery. The 14th Amendment uh, made all blacks in the country citizens. And if they're citizens, they're guaranteed the equal civil rights of anybody else in the country, regardless of race, color, condition, previous condition of servitude. Uh, 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote. Of course, women aren't going to get the right to vote until 1920 anyway. So it's just black men, but you know, they're not going to be allowed to vote. They got the right to vote, but they're not going to be allowed to vote. So all these three amendments were setting up the equality of the races in the country. Well, there's a difference between passing something and enforcing something. Before you leave uh, over there, there were a lot of people all throughout these, uh, these times uh, that offered what you might call <coughs> amazing grace grace for human beings. You'll see more of them in the presentation later on. But there was a song, <clears throat> a very common song, traditional music it's called, and it is the song Amazing Grace. It was written by a, a ship's captain, John Newton. He was a slave ship's captain, carrying cargoes of slaves across the ocean to the United States. And he wrote this song after he experienced a religious conversion in the middle of the ocean. And he turned his ship around and took his cargo of human beings back to their home country. And this song has been attributed to him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved It is great. 
They had the highest plant population in the country. Michigan was in the top five. So the plant was, was popular because everybody was joining clubs. You know, joining the Elks, the Moose, the Rotary Club. They wanted to be a member of a club. So the plant got really big. Um, my dad came here as an illegal in 1925. And he's, he's from Canada. So he didn't take too much practice. He's number one, he was white. And he spoke English, except for ending a sentence with a very so often. He wouldn't know that he was Canadian. And he got a job over in NY City, in the farm area. And he worked at a pickle factory, shooting rats off the rafters. I always said he never wanted to blast a pickle with the tail on it. Consequently, these guys will attest that I can't divide pickle even being on my plate. But anyway, my, my dad's 16. And he's passing himself off as 21. And these guys came up to him and said, hey Jack, why don't you join our club for 10 bucks? We got the best uh, dance in LaPeer County. Be some women, get a taste of liquor, turn to Prohibition. And uh, meet some women. My dad being red blooded said, no, okay. So he joined the clan. And he goes to his first clan meeting, and the guys up there talk about these damn immigrants coming into our country, taking our jobs, these Catholics trying to put Pope in the White House, then going on rant and raving about blacks. My dad goes, geez. I'm illegal alien and I'm Catholic. This is the wrong club. <laughs> so he packed up everything that night and moved. And uh, moved to Flint for 10 years later. He was a member of the, the sit down strike mm -hmm. at uh, Chevy plant in Flint that brought the UAW to, uh, uh, to the auto industry, which is another PowerPoint that I'd like to work on at some point in time. But anyway, segregation just really wasn't as clear cut. You know, I grew up in Detroit. Uh, Grand River, West Grand Boulevard, five blocks from Motown Records. So I was right downtown. Uh, and I, I could see segregation around me, but I was a white kid that didn't bother me all that much. Uh, we moved. Uh, my sisters went to Detroit McKenzie High School. Uh, Detroit McKenzie High School was 60% black. 40% white. Um, we moved. We moved five miles from uh, Grand River uh, and West Grand to Grand River and Five Mile Road and South Bend Expressway where they all come together. And I went to Detroit Redford. My high school had 4,200 students in it. Five black kids. You don't think there was segregation in Detroit? You're nuts. They call them redlining laws. And you had to go to school in the area where your house was. There was no cross-district busing or anything. So uh, uh, the two families that represented the five black kids, one of them was the, one of their father was a GM, an executive at GM, the other one was a, an executive at Ford. And they could afford to get screwed over by real estate agents. So they way overpaid for their houses so that your kids could go to Redford. Segregation, yeah, sure it was. It might not have been as in your face as it was in the deep south, but it was certainly there. In the south, you can see things like this at the Grand Theater of Malt in Mount Birmingham, colored with sit and balcony. There were two movie theaters in Detroit that uh, when I was a kid, we always went to the Tower Theater, the Bel Air Theater. Uh, my sister and I became best friends with a uh, brother and sister, John Smith and Janelle Smith. And uh, we we're best friends, we did everything together. And we go to the theater and they'd want to go up to the balcony. And I'd, why? I want to sit in the first row, man. I want to see the monster coming off the screen. And uh, well, that's where we feel most comfortable. And it would be all black up there with scattering a few of us. No law. It's just customary. So the jury law segregation means segregation by law. De facto segregation means segregation by fact or custom. No 
knowing your place. Florida law. Some of these laws are just letter. Well, they're all letter. The schools for white children, the schools for the Negro children shall be conducted separately. Oh, wow, that's like, when we think about segregation, that's the number one area that we think about segregation is being in the education, so that's from common. Alabama law. All passenger stations in the state operated by any motor transportation company shall have separate waiting rooms or space and separate ticket windows for white and colored races. Again, really common down south. The leader on the freedom riders are going to be trying to test them. Up north. No. This is the stupidest law of all the stupid laws. The officer in charge should not bury or allow to be buried any colored person to buy grounds set apart or used for the burial of white persons. So segregation doesn't end when you die. It's going to continue on after you're dead. I just don't understand. These are things that just boggled my mind when I was a kid. And the only reason I learned about it was because John and Janelle, their parents, my parents, were so close. There shall be maintained by the governing authorities of every hospital maintained by the state for the treatment of white colored patients, separate entrances for white colored patients. And those are that such entrances shall be used only by the race for which they're prepared. If you're white, you go to a black entrance, they're going to tell you to go around the front. Probably won't do it anyway. Louisiana literacy test. Now we're all former teachers of the educated most of us are former teachers of the education. And we can just imagine if we gave a test like this to some of our students, they'd freak out. This test is to be given to anyone who cannot prove a fifth grade education. Well, at this point in time, Probably 50% of the population of the United States didn't have a fifth grade education. I mean, it was, you, know, you went to work early. So the guy that's administering the test might not have a fifth grade education. Do what you're told in each state, nothing more, nothing less. Be careful, there's one wrong answer to those failure of the test. You have 10 minutes to complete the test. Check out the questions. Draw a line around the number or letter of this sentence. What's your answer? <laughs> yeah, well, my kids would say, Coach Burke, you've really gone around bad. You need to retire. <laughs> uh, and, but uh, it didn't matter whether or not you circle the number one or draw or letter, it didn't matter what you pick. If you're white, you're red. If you're black, you're wrong. Draw a line under the last word of this line. Was a word or is a line? You know, it didn't matter what you answered. Cross out the longest word this in this line. Well, is it longest or is it this or mine? It didn't matter. If you're white, you're right. If you're black, you're wrong. Circle the first first letter of the alphabet in this line. Again, dumb questions. If, sir, if you came in and you uh, were going to take a literacy test and you're a white man, and I would say, okay, spell the word can. If you said K-A-T, good, you're already passed. You come in, you're black, 